It was sort of a rare situation at the end of the 60s and the early 70s where there were a few bands, you know, such as Purple and, mm. and ELP, were nice at the time, where a, a drummer actually came through and became a name in his own right. I mean, you and Carl were one of the, well, in fact, were the, were the two drummers that, that people, you know, copied. If they copied us, it's... It... We copied other people, and if they copy us, it's just a natural progression, you know. Um, I think we were very lucky to be around at a time when uh, music was very exciting, you know. There was a, there was a lot of... Um, all, all the borders had been broken down, and you could do exactly what you wanted. Who um, did you copy? Initially, mm -hmm. Bobby Elliott, Hollies. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's quite a Why? Because he had a clean sound. Everybody else was all muddy and flappy, and he had a real sharp sound. Um, that was why. I mean, when I bought the first Purple albums, mm. uh, which well, shows of Deep Purple, which is going back to the days of Rod Evans and you and were Nick the Sibble. one, were you? Yes, I was the mad fraud. Yeah. Uh, tracks like Mandrake Root were one of the first first tracks. We actually could hear the drums. You could hear, you know, the drum patterns. Every mistake, yes. Going, just I've got to ask you because there was a single that was released over here that very few people know about, uh, which was Emeretta. Yeah. Mm. Which finished up with a drum solo, which was most unusual for a, a single to finish up with that. Yeah, well, that was, that was really because the song was so... Um, so simple in itself, and it was written so quickly because, you know, contractual obligations. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't think of an ending, and the easiest thing to do is for everybody just to stop playing and leave me fiddling around in tempo, you know, fade. And there was no, there was no great sort of thought of putting a drum solo in there. I mean, so we really couldn't think of an ending. <laughs> that, was, that was that. On, on the, you know, when you first went to America, it's one of the first English bands to break in America. Yeah. Did you, uh, were you aware, for example, when you did, uh, you know, some of the American TV programs, which most bands never did after that? Yeah. That people were actually watching, expecting you to do something special. Well. We didn't know. We were sort of like lambs to the slaughter over there. I mean, it was first time, you know, the, the great big US, and we just did as we were told. Um, the record company man said, this will be good for your exposure, this will sell you records. Well, we didn't know. You know, we didn't know a thing, so we just said yes to everything. I mean, How so did you join Purple? I joined Purple by uh, Richie having seen me playing a year... having seen me played a year earlier in the Star Club in Hamburg. Um, he just thought I was most over-the-top thing he'd ever seen. Um, and when he put Purple together, the singer who was in my band, that was Rod Evans, applied for the job with Purple, and Richie put two and two together and said, is that drummer still with you? And Rod said, yes. And so Richie said, bring him along. And the name Purple came from the song? Yeah, it did, really. Richie's grandma used to play it. I think it's the last thing she played before she snuffed it, actually. <laughs> the oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> that impressive, eh? Yeah, yeah. it was really that... Uh, yeah. When Purple folded, how did you feel? Um, at the time it folded, I wasn't very sad at all. I mean, so the whole thing had gone upside down. The people involved were not functioning as they should function. Uh, what I think should have really happened, for the good of everybody and maybe for the, for the good of music itself, was that when Richie left, we should have said, OK, look, everybody go and do what they want to do and we'll come back every two years and we'll make a record, we'll do a tour, we'll have fun, and we'll still be able to keep our, you know, our sort of sanity by doing things we want to do ourselves. Um, I think it was a very naive move and a very silly move just to say, that's the end of it. We tried one more time with Tommy Bowling, um, who played really well, but the, the chemistry did not happen. Now you've had the experience of, and the chance of working with other musicians as well, would you like to, to carry on doing that, or would you like to put a purple back together again? What yeah. could we do? You know, we could be playing the hits and the, the popular things from ten years ago. And if it's just nostalgia, then the only real reason music to do it is for it's, the, it's money. the money in your what hand. What about White Snake? Well, that's, that's gone on to a new thing now, because I've left that. Um, they're going to tour nine or ten months of the year, and I'm not prepared to do that anymore. I have other interests in my life, um, and that doesn't... You know, I don't really want to spend nine or ten months a year in a hotel room. There are other things for me to do. So whatever they're going to do is great. I'm having fun now with Gary Moore. We're having fun. We're, we're making music that I'm enjoying. Um, it's, it's a nice, not temporary arrangement, but neither is it a permanent one. I mean, so mm -hmm. we both look at it as well. We're both having fun, and it, and it is paying for itself that we'll carry on.
What about fronting your own band, an Ian Pace band? You thought about that? I've thought about it, but for a drummer to do that, it really is very difficult. For somebody who doesn't sing, doesn't write, doesn't actually play any other instrument, um, I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lie, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. fronting your own band, when you, you know, it's not, it's not on. But you want to carry on playing, you want to carry on working. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I want to do it on my terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've earned that right through the years of, of hard work in the past and, and the luck of success, I've earned the right to pick and choose my time and my place. Um, and while I do it like that, I'll, I'll always enjoy it. And when I'm enjoying it, I'll play well. If I don't, if I don't enjoy it, I don't play well. The thing that's interesting is I can count myself as one of them. I know at least half a dozen others that feel exactly the same as you do. Mm. And it's nice for situations like we have in Gas Tank, hopefully, for those sort of people to get together and play and maybe produce some sort of music without having the pressures and the problems that... Uh, that's right, that until you come up with a, a thing like we have to play today. Sorry about that. The, the Brain Strangler, yes. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. And, I, and uh, please come back again and uh, I hope the cheque clears. Certainly. Could you make it ten pounds next time? All right. OK, mate. Yeah. Fantastic. We smile at each other forever now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> During rehearsals, yes, we do have rehearsals, Ian Pace said to me, he said, uh, it's very difficult to get other percussion and drums on a TV programme, so why don't we just knock up a piece that sort of enhances the prowess that I've got. Well, he made the check out to cash, and we wrote this piece of music. And during the recording, uh, I say rehearsal, I should say, uh, our producer and director, Mr Paul Knight, who wants a name check, and also Jerry, walked in and said, is it all together? And we said, possibly. And we realised that we hadn't got a name for this piece of music. It's called Possibly.